Thank you very much, Dr. Gordon. Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to be able to talk to you again. About six years ago, I had the pleasure to present to anti-aging community my new original theory of aging, which is gene silencing theory of aging. Uh, well, since then, we covered quite a territory. We made a lot of progress, and uh, we are able to prove this theory in numerous laboratory studies in our institute and also in some other institutes, as well as uh, we were able to run successful animal testing and finally human trials, uh, which led to the introduction of a line of supplements and cosmetics. Today, I would like to concentrate on animal testing and human trials, but again, I would like to refresh your memory uh, regarding uh, the theory itself. Well, there's no doubt that one of the greatest achievements in modern medicine was the ciphering of the structure of the human genome. But soon after this was accomplished, it was found that uh, only about 10% of the genes in our genome are active in the perfectly healthy body of the 25 years or adult, adult individual. So what happened to the rest of the genes? Well, these genes were very important during various stages of development, but after the action was no longer necessary, they were switched off or silenced. So that's how we are left only with about 10% of the genes of the genome at the perfect young age of 25. It soon occurred that the genome is just the tip of the iceberg, and the rest of the iceberg is gradually emerging now, and this is the epigenome. The epigenome is a relatively obscure term. It was introduced first in 1940 by a British embryologist, uh, Conrad Weddington, but then it was soon forgotten. Until recently, it was resurrected again, and about a year and a half ago, a Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to two American researchers who studied just one of the aspects of the epigenome. So what is the epigenome? Well, epigenome is a gigantic switchboard, a system of molecular switches, which is switching off and on genes during our lifetime. It's like having a separate genome for every type of the cells in our body, which conservative estimate is just 160 cells type, but we know very well that even in brain, biochemically we have at least 1,000 type of different neurons. And this is the system which is changing all the time. It's like today we have one set of genes which are active and tomorrow a different one. So it's ever-changing genome and like multiple genomes which we have to deal. The system is so complex that uh, the experts in the field uh, think that it will take at least 25 years to fully decipher this. Well, a genome, epigenome initiative has been put in place about two years ago by American Association for Cancer Research, and similar action is going on in Europe now, so hopefully this will bring a lot of good results. Well, a genome is like a set of instructions, like recipes, to make a protein or to make a separate dish. But uh, all of these 23,000 recipes are sitting on the shelves in the library and the epigenome is the librarian, which is picking up proper recipes for at the proper time of our life and is uh, giving orders to make a proper protein or proper dish from these recipes. And after the job is finished, well, the recipe or the gene is becoming silent. The recipe goes back to the shelf of uh, the library, which is the genome. Uh, in uh, the epigenome, we can identify three major mechanisms. Well, as we know, the genes in our body are encoded in the structure of the DNA and that are separated in the chromosomes. 
The chromosomes have a tight, compact structure. And in order to make this information effective, which is encoded in the genome, in order to transcribe this information, in order to remove this information from the library shelf, it is necessary to loosen the tight, and tight structure of the chromosome. And this is called chromatin remodeling. So the first mechanism of uh, the epigenome is chromatin remodeling, and one of sub-mechanism is acetylation of the histones. Then once we have a loose thread of the DNA, then the transcription can take place, providing that uh, we don't have uh, this piece of DNA covered with certain organic groups, which are methyl groups, very simple groups, CHT groups, which cover tightly certain parts of the genes. And if it happens that the promoter of the gene is tightly covered by the shield of the methyl groups, then uh, the gene is silent. The gene is switched off. It's still in the body, it's still intact, but it's not active. So the second mechanism of epigenome, and perhaps the most important, is methylation of the DNA. And finally, when the transcription takes place and we have formation of mRNA, there's another mechanism which is in place, which is informational RNA. This is a system of short-sharing RNAs which can scramble this information, which can destroy mRNA. And this is for what the Nobel Prize in medicine was given to two American researchers. This was informational RNA. Well, so how this epigenome works during our lifetime? There is a period in our life, and this is soon after conception, when practically all of the genes in our body are active, and the genome is completely, almost completely demethylated. But then soon after, the genes are being switched off because their action is no longer needed. Of course, we have a lot of genes which are active during the time of organogenesis, but after the major organs have been formed, we don't need these genes anymore. It's obvious that once, after we have one heart, we don't need another one, and the genes which are necessary to create important organs in our bodies are gathering dust for the rest of our lives, are switched off, are silenced during the, uh, the, because of the process of methylation of the promoters of the genes. A big change in the gene activity occurs soon after birth, because now, the new human beings is coming from a completely different environment, from intrauterine environment out to external environment. And certainly, a completely different set of genes were necessary during the life in the uterus compared to the life in the external world. For instance, the genes which are necessary to create fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin F, necessary to catch oxygen where we have low concentration of oxygen inside the uterus are no longer necessary because out inside the uterus there's a plenty of oxygen. This means that these genes are switched off or silenced for the rest of the life. Many genes are again silenced during the development period and finally we are reaching the age of 25 when we have perfect, probably perfect ratio of active genes various versus silenced genes but this is not going to last too long. These 10% of genes which are active is going to decrease because of the aging process. And for instance, when a woman goes to menopause, the important genes necessary to make female hormones are being silenced. Then when the hairs are graying and when we are losing hairs, the important genes are being silenced also. And the same process affects many other genes. For instance, the genes which are helping us to detoxify uh, in the liver, which are helping us to provide proper immunity.